It is all in the mind, skeptics often declare, when somebody reports a ghost. But the psychological explanation simply does not apply when a paranormal incident is experienced by more than one person. Undoubtedly, some ghosts are all in the mind. I do not deny that. Floorboards, mice and pipes can create noises which can generate phantasms in the human imagination, especially in the middle of the night. However, when a ghost is actually observed by multiple witnesses, all rational explanations must go out of the window. The following phantom was observed by several people over a prolonged period of time, and its presence is backed up with the historical facts relating to the ghost. Up in Blundellsands, there stands an old Victorian house which overlooks the waters of Liverpool Bay. In the 1950s, a gang of workmen was charged with the task of converting the waterfront house into flats. Before the workmen started their job, the foreman started a full inspection of the rundown property. In the attic, he stumbled across something highly unusual. The huge helm wheel of an old ship that had been mounted in front of the garret window. The bemused foreman surmised that the previous occupant must have either been a sailor or a sea captain, and, as he playfully turned the wheel, he looked beyond the dusty attic windows at the sea's horizon. Meanwhile, one of the workers was examining an array of maps and charts that dotted the wall. These maps covered every part of the globe. More maritime items were uncovered in the attic that afternoon. A sextant, a finely balanced compass, a small brass folding telescope and a huge battered looking trunk. The foreman fully expected the trunk to be locked, but when the lid was lifted open, it revealed nothing but an old sword which resembled an 18th century naval cutlass. He carefully lifted the sword out of the trunk, and as he did so, he and the labourer were startled by the sound of an accordion playing somewhere in the house, accompanied by the cries of seagulls. As the foreman turned to the workman with a look of puzzlement, he noticed that the old ship's wheel had started spinning on its axis. The workman turned and witnessed this strange activity too, upon which he started to back out of the attic muttering, I don't like this one bit, I'm off. The foreman was more amazed than frightened, that is, until events took an even stranger turn. Another weird noise reverberated through the attic, just like the creaking of a ship's timbers. Suddenly, the entire floor seemed to tilt and sway, and the two men feared that the whole building was ready to collapse. With the helm spinning and the yells of the phantom seagulls, the foreman felt as if he was standing on the swaying deck of a ship at sea. He decided to run, but as he bolted for the door, something powerful yanked the old sword from out of his hand. He glanced backwards and saw the cutlass suspended in mid-air, as if hanging by an invisible thread. Understandably, the foreman and his gang refused to work in the attic, and instead of converting it into a room, they left it the way it was and simply locked the door. When the landlord of the old house heard this, he took the foreman to court. All the same, even he did not like the spooky atmosphere in the attic and never ventured up there alone. He knew that in the 1860s a demented sea captain named William Stewart lived in the Blundellsands house and, according to old rumours, he had been a cruel and twisted man who had committed some unspeakable act of evil on the premises. No one knew just what Captain Stewart was supposed to have done, but the landlord had heard from his father that there had been a double murder in the house long ago. In 1955, the Blundellsands dwelling was subdivided into six flats, which were occupied by five couples and an elderly spinster. In April 1955, the spinster, Jean Fleming, let out a scream one night at half past twelve. Two medical students and their girlfriends, who were lodging at the house, ran up to the third floor flat to find out what was the matter. They discovered Miss Fleming lying on the floor, unconscious. When she came to, she claimed she had fainted after seeing a terrible apparition. The bodies of a naked man and woman were lying on their bed, dismembered and disemboweled. Their heads, arms and legs had been severed from their torsos, and it had all looked so real, she had even seen the blood soaking into her duvet. She was so terrified that she left the lodging house that night and went to stay with her cousin in Kirkdale. Everyone in the lodging house surmised that the confused old lady had simply had a bad dream. But later that week, in the dead of night, something took place which turned all the lodgers into shambling, nervous wrecks.
The time was 3.15am and a young couple on the ground floor were awakened by a loud bang which echoed down the stairway. It seemed to originate in the attic. They listened intently and heard a succession of thumps on the stairs. Then the strains of an accordion playing some sort of sea shanty drifted down the stairway. On the second floor, the medical students and their girlfriends were also awakened by the racket and one of the girls got out of bed and looked through the keyhole. She let out a terrible scream, then rushed into the arms of her alarmed boyfriend who was sitting up in bed. What's wrong, who is it? he asked. She hugged him and started to shake violently. She claimed that a weird looking man with wild staring eyes was on the landing outside, trying to carry a barrel down the stairs. The man wore a leather cap and a long black coat and he had blood on his hands. The two students were so frightened that they refused to budge from the room until the first light and barricaded themselves in behind the door. Across the landing, the other medical student, a young man named Robert, had made the mistake of opening the door to find out who was making all the noise. He got the clearest view of the strange man before slamming the door and locking it. He later described the man as outdated with a black cap similar to the ones worn by the sea skippers in the 19th century. Robert had seen the bloody hands too and also noticed blood around the man's mouth, on his grizzled beard and in his moustache. The odd-looking stranger's glaring mad eyes had also sent a shiver down his spine. The couple in the ground floor flat did not dare open their door to see what all the commotion was about, but they noted how the rumbling sound and strange music seemed to continue down into the cellar where it came to an abrupt end. The lodgers soon realised that a ghost was at large in the house and contacted the landlord to tell him about the nerve-shattering episode. He visited the house and instead of dismissing the claims, he seemed very jumpy and on edge. When he went up to the attic, he found that the door had been forced open. He arranged for a new padlock to be fitted to the door, but in the following week, the sinister man in black gave a repeat performance. Only this time, the terrified lodgers who were brave enough to peep through their keels saw that the seafaring shade was now pulling a trunk down the stairs. On this occasion, he was heard to cackle and mutter to himself in a raspy voice as he made his way down to the cellar. Enough was enough, and early next morning there was nothing short of a mass exodus from the haunted lodging house. The landlord begged them to stay, but soon found himself alone in the house. As a last resort, a priest was invited in to exorcise the ghost, but even he fled when he allegedly saw the blade of the old sword being thrust at him through the attic door. As the priest and the landlord flew down the stairs in a state of absolute panic, the sound of laughter reverberated through the house. The landlord later died after a short illness, and the house was bought by a wealthy retired couple from Aintree named Joan and Freddie Osborne. A few days after the Osbournes had moved in, they too heard the spooky sea shanty being played somewhere in the building by an invisible accordion. Then, in June 1958, Joan Osborne awoke in bed one night to be confronted by the menacing ghost of the bearded sea captain leaning over her. His wide, insane-looking eyes peered into her terrified face and she was paralysed with fear. The ghost's face was spattered with droplets of blood. He raised his arm, brandishing a long sword in his hand ready to strike her. She managed to squeeze her eyes closed and suddenly, regaining the power to move, let out a scream, thinking some burglar was about to slay her in her bed. Her husband bolted upright from the bed and he actually watched as the ghostly sea captain melted away into the darkness of the bedroom. The Osbournes got in touch with a local historian friend named Ian McCauley, who specialised in maritime history. They asked him to research the history of their newly purchased house and, over the next two months, he uncovered a disturbing tale of murder and madness which seemed to explain the ghostly phenomena. He learned that in the 1860s a Captain William Stewart had bought the property. Stewart had a streak of insanity which he had undoubtedly inherited from his grandfather, a captain who had murdered seven of his own crew on a ship called the Mary Russell in 1828. Stuart's grandfather had stood trial for murder and had been found guilty and insane. 
Like his grandfather, William Stewart was also accused of murdering one of the crewmen on a ship named the Seabird in 1859, but he was later acquitted. After a prosperous career importing rum and sugar from Barbados, Captain Stewart retired and married an Irish girl by the name of Mary O'Monaghan. The couple moved into the waterfront house at Blundellsands, and when Stewart learned that his old ship was being decommissioned, he salvaged the wheel of the vessel along with several sections of the deck. The floorboards of the deck were laid in the attic of their new home and the helm was also mounted in front of the attic window. The ship's sextant and compass were also recovered by Stuart for sentimental reasons and he kept them in a trunk along with his trusty old spyglass and sword. Stuart's neighbours nicknamed him Jack Tar and often sneered at the way the old seafarer went down to the water and promenade each morning to feed the seagulls. But what really amused his neighbours was the way he stood before his attic window, manipulating the wheel of his ridiculous imaginary ship as he gazed out at the distant horizon of Liverpool Bay. Then, Mary Stewart went missing. People asked William what had become of her, but the old sea dog would only smile enigmatically and say, Come back across the Irish Sea, no doubt. When Mary had not been seen in over a month, the neighbours alerted the police, and the retired captain was taken into custody and quizzed. A thorough search of the house revealed blood stains on the mattress of the steward's double bed. Traces of blood were also found in the barrel and trunk in the cellar. When Stuart was asked to explain the bloodstains, he gradually became more and more incoherent and started to sing and laugh out loud. He was committed to an asylum for the criminally insane, and in 1870, just before he died, he made a startling deathbed confession. He claimed that he had murdered his wife and their lover upon discovering them in his bed. On the night in question, a thunderstorm was raging and Stuart was able to enter the house without being heard. In a fit of jealous rage, he entered the bedroom, then impaled Mary and their lover with his old sword in one swift thrust through the man's lower back. He then hacked the screaming couple to death, dismembering their limbs in the process. Stuart was so enraged at the man who had been to bed with his beloved wife that he sliced off his ears and fried them in a pan before eating them. Stuart hid the gruesome body parts in a barrel and trunk that he kept in the attic, but later transferred the containers downstairs to the cellar. The arms, legs, torsos and heads were gradually sawn up into small chunks and fed to the seagulls during his morning walks along the promenades of Blundellsands, and the fragmented bones of the murder victims were simply tossed into the sea. When the Osbournes had heard the full story of the murderous Captain Stewart, they promptly abandoned their new home and put it up for sale. The house is still standing today, and for some reason, it lies empty. Ha, 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 ha.